Hello, and welcome to Insurrection with Brenton Lengel, uh, hosted formerly on the Starcom Radio Network, now hosted on the internet, because, you know, it, it, the, the future, it, it's now. It's, 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 no, it's not. This is the present. Oh, God, I screwed that up. Um, <laughs> all right, here I am. Um, I am a poet, playwright, uh, author of the Ringo-nominated comic book series Snow White Zombie Apocalypse, the second issue of which is out and has been shipped to all Kickstarter backers just in time for Halloween. And we will be starting our third Kickstarter to pay for the third issue uh, just as soon as um, uh, the election is over. So it doesn't, whatever I'm doing doesn't get swallowed by um, the mindless political process. And speaking of mindless political processes here, uh, <laughs> we've got Bobby B of uh, the uh, formerly 5x5, five five, now Mustache Mafia podcast. How are you doing, Bobby? Oh, I'm outstanding. I'm living uh, living the living the American dream in lockdown in, in sunny Florida. <laughs> it's lockdown in sunny Florida, where, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, they uh, have opened up all of the businesses and you all are cast out to die. Yep, you can go to a bar and uh, catch COVID with your old-fashioned. Uh, or if you're, you know, not a young boomer like me, I actually order a, a millennial drink. I don't know what the kids drink nowadays. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but what is today? But yesterday's tomorrow, by the way. Uh, you're you're a, you're a spiritual boomer. Yeah. <laughs> at this point, yeah. Yeah. Um, there are. Um, yeah, I, I'm in upstate New York, and you know things are still locked down for the most part. Uh, but like the second wave, I'm really scared about it because like it hit New York City really hard, but upstate didn't get it too bad, and so now I think upstate's going to get it. <laughs> Just uh, buy a biovisor, man. Yeah, we could do that. I, my my wife was sewing masks earlier. In fact, um, I I would come in and have to like remove all the sewing stuff from <laughs> behind me on the on the table because she was uh, you know made some really good masks though. So we are here to talk about chapter six of Homage to Catalonia. Uh, for those of you who have been following us, we have been going chapter by chapter with uh, analysis and uh, uh, of uh, George Orwell's epic. True, it sometimes gets filed under fiction, but this is a true memoir of George Orwell, uh, one of the most famous and important authors in uh, Western history, um, and his uh, time fighting fascists and banning them from life with a gun <laughs> during the Spanish Civil War. Um, now, last chapter, like you guys really, I was really excited to see that you stuck with us through it because it was a pretty boring info dump chapter on like all of the political intricacies that ultimately kind of talked about why uh, the anarchists lost or not just the anarchists, but the, the, the communists, why the Republic lost to the fascists. Um, and uh, you guys stuck through it. It, it amazed me. Um, but this chapter, well, Bobby, why don't you tell me? Because I'm, I'm very excited to do this chapter. Yeah, so this this is a great chapter. This is a lot more fun than the uh, previous uh, info dump chapter where the story came kind of screeching to a halt. We're seeing in detail the uh, siege of Huesca, which I'm going to horribly mispronounce because I'm an ugly gringo and I only speak the one language <laughs> and do it poorly. Is uh, gringo, does that apply? Is that Mexican or does that I, like apply to all Spaniards? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a Mexican uh, thing, yeah. but uh, <laughs> but it, it fits me pretty good. So what is language is use, as Wittgenstein would say. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's right. I just quoted a German to justify my misuse of Spanish language idioms. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny, by the way, uh, just on the off chance, I've got a, a, a a European production company that's interested in my movie about Buena Ventura de Rudy. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, yeah. It's really exciting because these guys are really cool. Uh, I got a good feeling about it. Um, and they want to uh, translate the script into Spanish and hopefully sell it to like a, a Spanish company to, to produce in Spain with like some, oh, that, maybe Javier Bardem or something. They make um, really good movies over there, man. Uh, there, there's a movie called um, Alistair, which I'm mispronouncing again. But it's uh, starring Viggo Mortensen. It's based on a, a series of novels about um, the Eighty Years' War, where Viggo Mortensen plays the lead, and it was an amazingly shot film. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, the, yeah. I've seen the work that these guys do. I'm really excited. They haven't done a big feature yet, but uh, yeah. this could be it. Yeah. And um, you know, the script is good, but the, the guy who is a native Spanish speaker, you know, 
from Spain, actual, you know, um, w- was like, yeah, um, the Spanish that you wrote in this, it's Mexican. <laughs> I'm like, well, that makes sense because I had a Mexican help me with the Spanish. <laughs> so, they're, they're, they're super snobby about that too. Yeah, yeah. So he's, so he's um, kind of going through the whole thing, but it was really fun because we were doing, he, I was talking with him and his producer and they were like, hey, um, like so how much of this is real like because we're going to get shredded by the right wing about this and you know um so like how much of what you wrote like actually happened and i'm like oh well this 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 and then just like holy crap <laughs> like and i'm like yeah when the guy climbed out the, the the window like on a rope made of bed sheets yeah that that actually happened <laughs> he's like what that can't happen i'm like no i that's what i said but yeah that's the historical record <laughs> crazy stuff happened uh in these days and we're, we're uh I promise we'll get into the homage to catalonia but uh an irishman that i'm uh related to uh helped break out uh Eamon de valera who was a big ira guy oh wow uh, he helped him break out of prison because de valera would get the uh, keys mm-hmm. and he was an altar boy and he pressed the keys in a candle and they nice. sent the can and they sent the candles out in the mail and they made the key to get him out. Him out. That's <laughs> incredible. Him out. Yeah. So, um, by the way, we have a, a comment here. Uh, Die uh, Tolds Rune says because of cancel cult because of cancel culture. Orwell canceled the fascist. He did. <laughs> he did. He totally canceled. He canceled their their will to live. We have uh, we have we have some serious cancel culture here. So much for the tolerant left. So let's get into chapter six. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, we ended the last chapter where he's being educated about uh, politics and their relation to war in a dirty awful dank farmhouse <laughs> in uh in spain and he's uh he's describing the line where he is now and he's really settling into the, the routine of a war of position uh if you want to learn a bit about the difference between war of maneuver and war of position and you don't feel like reading uh Clausewitz, which is a really thick and dense book uh you can actually pick up boring uh, ner- bor- you're a nerd but <laughs> i am i am but uh you can actually pick up and i actually bought this at a px on an american military base you can pick up chairman mao's book on guerrilla warfare and a good portion i believe of chapter two is devoted to that so if you want to learn some more technical stuff i would definitely recommend picking that up but orwell is settling into the reality of this and uh he's actually in kind of what used to be an orchard and he's writing about how at the beginning, he's uh, finding flowers in trenches. and trenches. Mm-hmm. I, I, I found that really interesting. It, it's very evocative of imagery that uh, we're all probably familiar with. If you've seen or read uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, that figures prominently into the plot of that. No spoilers for a book from the 1920s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, you find uh, rare moments of beauty in uh, the otherwise um, horrific display of warfare. Uh, my experience in Afghanistan, I was in a beautiful mountain bowl uh and bagram air base which is uh it's, it's just surrounded by this big mountain bowl and i would love to go hike those mountains if they weren't full of landmines drug dealers <laughs> and people who wanted to decapitate me uh well, but hopefully uh, someday you will and yes, avoid the drug dealers and the decapitation. decapitation and the landmines especially yeah. but <laughs> you, you know it, it's interesting just on the point of um like hiking and war um yeah. when i was hiking the appalachian trail maine to georgia in north carolina i actually came upon uh, graves and a, and a monument to uh, two Union soldiers. And I think it was two Union soldiers and a young boy. Um, that this had been, they had come back to North Carolina to visit their families, and the Confederates in the area had heard about the the secret visit taking place, and had like basically crept up on the cabin and killed the the, the father and the brother, uh, the, the father and the son, and also the you know young boy lookout. And so like I, I, and I hiked through that area. So, you know, and like went right by their graves and um, faced down my first bear actually oh. just in front of that. <laughs> and that's why I own a 4570. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, it, it's, it's a bear, it's a black bear. So like it, it saw me come and just ran off immediately. And I remember being like, yeah, that's right. <laughs> black bears running from you make you feel like so manly though. I just heard um, there was like this huge issue in New Hampshire 
where some ANCAPs took control of a town. I, I heard about this. <laughs> and it got overrun with bears. <laughs> and they were arguing one of them was arguing that uh the they should respect the bears autonomy <laughs> yeah. and not not infringe on the NAP to, yeah. <laughs> to just let the bears and then the others were like, I'm gonna feed these bears in my backyard and you can't stop me. <laughs> it it, 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 it kind of should be like a, a test of your ideology to see how well it handles a bear incursion on your village. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like that's, God, that's, I, that's, that, I, I mean that 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 that's like 4000 BCE like test of your ideology. Yeah. <laughs> just can you stop the bears? Does can the society you... stop the bears? So in, in this case they are not fascists. They're not bears but fascists. So fascist. Wolves. Orwell is in, he sees the the flower in the trench and is overcome by its beauty. Continue. Yeah, he he then notes that uh he finds the first clear water that he's seen in country since he mm -hmm. got there and he, he takes his first bath in six weeks, <laughs> which, right. will, which you'll, yeah, you'll find out later why uh, that was so important to him. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I'll spoil it a little bit now. It's because he got lice. He was, he, he's, he was saying how lousy he was and how lousy everyone is and not, not lousy in the sense that they're bad people, but lousy in the sense that they're literally infested with infested vermin. Infested with vermin and lice. When I was on the AT, baths were really important. I, I was bathing once every few weeks. I don't think I ever went six weeks without bathing. But I remember we would... Um, people like day hikers would come by and like th after we finished would first be like, Hey, do you have any food? <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then after that, um, after they left, we'd be talking about how good they smelled for like <laughs> a mile on We're like, man, these people were so clean. That, that was my experience uh, of war too, though, because yeah. Oh really? Yeah. When, when I was deployed, we had, uh, I was super fortunate in that we had access to an actual laundry, but it was, it was a laundry that was run by the locals and, mm -hmm they didn't do a very good job of running the laundry and we're on a big base and the base has like yeah. burn pits and, and uh, septic open septic uh, systems and stuff. Gross. So it smells <laughs> bad in the first place. And then you're getting covered in the dirt from Afghanistan, which doesn't have a great smell in the first place. And I swear the locals would just run the, the uniforms just through a little bit of water, mm -hmm. and like not really use detergent or anything. So I had dirt on my uniform for like 10 and a half months. That was just staying there. Everybody smells bad. And that's a, that's a feature of war that doesn't get captured in art a lot is mm -hmm. that everybody stinks like <laughs> miserably <laughs> because you're not, you're even if you're bathing regularly, which I was, uh, you're still sweating and, and exerting yourself in an unfamiliar climate. And, you don't have regular access to like good laundry. So your clothes are just going to stink. And it, it, it's something that never quite gets captured. Uh, there's, there's a funny story from around this era where we smell a vision. <laughs> yeah. You, you, yeah. Till we have smell a vision, then it's going to be rough. Uh, they'll, they'll stop making submarine movies. The Germans actually, one of the first colognes is a thing called a 4711. It smells like, uh, an orange dyed in a barber shop. If you're curious, it's got a cool bottle though. But well, uh, what, what I'll just say is before before you continue, yeah. um, clearly because I have experience with, with this, I, I'm just like you and Orwell. Exactly, yeah. no okay. difference. No, none at all, dude. Uh, I'll get, I'll send you some medals. Um, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> but uh, uh, they used to chuck uh, boxes of 4711 into the U-boats during the war because they didn't have showers. <laughs> they were like, they were like, Good luck, boys. Here you go. <laughs> My God, I cannot imagine being trapped in a freaking like U-boat or a, or a, or a submarine with a bunch of, ah, oh ah. uh, yeah. If you ever get the chance, definitely go there. There's a few museum submarines around the country. If you ever get the chance, go in one and figure out what that was like. I, I have been in one actually, cause I was raised near DC and they, oh, yeah. they had a submarine you could go in and I was a, I was a cub scout. So <laughs> yeah. I've done all the, the Cub Scout. If you're a Cub Scout in and around DC, you see entirely too much military stuff. <laughs> yeah. The, the, the principle for Orwell though is, is remarkably similar because he's in dank farmhouses and dank trenches. Ah. So, so all these dudes are just going to be smelly and miserable. Uh, that sounds great. All right, so, let's keep going. So he moves on and we've, we've, we've covered this in the, I believe the second chapter, but he's noting that all the casualties they had were from strays, stray bullets. Uh, that aim, aimed fire isn't really a thing where he is because it's a quieter area of the front. Uh, again, I got to kind of emphasize this. Being hit by a bullet isn't a function necessarily of somebody aiming very well. It's a function of you being exposed. The uh, The U.S. Army actually did a long study on this in the 60s, and they ended in a thing called the, the Salvo Project, which was an insane <laughs> attempt at... Uh, basically turning every gun into a buckshot uh, rifle, <laughs> but uh, it didn't work. But uh, the U.S. military did find that being hit was actually a 
product of exposure, not necessarily aiming. So that's a little little uh, inside baseball for people not really familiar with uh, yeah. warfare. Uh, if you're involved in warfare, then I'm, I'm going to use the same strategy with that that I use when I play the Call of Cthulhu RPG. Don't look at anything. Hey. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, his friend actually loses the use of his left arm because he's hit by a mm-hmm. bullet. Uh, and uh, I'm reading the, I'm reading this and I'm like, yep, called it. Like he, he's exposed and he gets hit. So uh, it, it's something that um, he, Orwell didn't even appreciate while he was in the midst of it. And it's something that's kind of interesting about war. Um, the NRA was actually started in the United States because after the Civil War, people realized that uh, soldiers didn't actually know how to use the sights on rifles and 600 and something thousand troops were still killed in that war. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> Um, they had no uh, idea how to sight their guns, but they still managed to hit people yeah, by yeah. The sheer law of averages. That, that bullet's going somewhere. <laughs> and in this case, it was one of his British friend's arms. Uh, the fascists at this point are starting to uh, drop artillery. And it's interesting uh, because it's a different scenario from modern artillery. Uh, modern artillery, especially ours in America, is aimed by computer and it's calculated precisely to drop artillery shells so you don't hit the same spot twice it's it's designed to hit very specific targets uh, it's it's surgical but back then it, you've got guys on these artillery guns who are taking a protractor and guessing the parabola basically of the artillery shell <laughs> and, and, you, and you can see this as you're reading this because he notes that they're mostly shooting shooting at their cookhouse which is one of the landmarks in that area he says the the dangerous places are the cookhouse and the roads, and those are all landmarks that the guy can see from his artillery position, and then he can just drop shells on. So he's kind of just like, I can see that, and I can yeah. see that, so I'm just going to fire stuff in that direction and hope that I hit yeah. something. And Depend- if I don't remember, the, the mortars weren't particularly intimidating for them, were they? Not really. Uh, uh, mortars scare the shit out of me, so I don't know how much of that is uh, bravado. Excuse my language. Uh, he also notes that the artillery ammo that they're using, these are cannons that are actually being shot at him because he notes that they're 150 millimeter rounds. Uh, but they're they're kind of poorly made 150 millimeter artillery rounds. So he's noting that uh, the craters that they leave are six feet wide by four feet deep. Uh, a modern 155 round uh, mm-hmm. will leave a crater that's something like eight feet deep and about 12 feet wide on even terrain. So it's much bigger boom nowadays. And that one in four of the artillery shells are duds. And as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm figuring out what it is, and it's the fuses in these uh, rounds, because he notes that some of the duds they find are dated from 1917, and we're in the 1930s at this point. Which, wow. Which ordnance from back then will still work. Uh, I have friends who use rifles that are using bullets from back then, and they still work. But the trick is you have to store them well. So mm-hmm. they're, they're stored poorly, and the fuses have gone bad, so they're not detonating. And a funny story at this point is that they have an artillery shell, he said, that had a nickname. That would just go back and forth. Every day. <laughs> so they should shoot the shell. Yeah, like, the fascists would shoot them. They'd yeah. pick it up, put it in their mortar, shoot it back at the fascists, and it just never exploded. And it just keeps going, and they're like, "Well, it's a perfectly good shell. It's popping in the gun." <laughs> well, obviously, it's not a perfectly good, <laughs> good shell. shell. <laughs> what was the nickname for it? He didn't say. I was kicking myself. Oh, in come on, Orwell. It's good. We that, need details like that. We need to know that the that the shell is nicknamed Ted. Yeah, yeah. It's Ted, Ted the Orange. Oh, here comes Ted. <laughs> <laughs> good to see you again, Ted. How you doing, buddy? Uh, he does note that the propaganda actually affects this, too, because mm-hmm. – there's all these stories that uh, the people behind the lines in the Franco territories are sabotaging all the artillery shells bravely. And there's little notes in the artillery shell that says red front. And he's like, I never once saw that. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> they're, they're just making that up because their, their shells suck. And no one wants to admit it. So the, yeah. Yeah. They sabotage these totally. Yeah, and it, it, it's 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 uh, advantageous for both sides because Franco gets to say like my shells are bad because of sabotage, and mm-hmm. then the uh, the left guys get to say that the shells are bad because of sabotage <laughs> because we sabotaged them, and, and and again not because it's it's just a garbage ammunition they're firing at each other. <laughs> Stored in an open warehouse since 1917, and the uh, the sh- the fuse is rotted away. Yeah. I mean, quick, quick little funny story. Uh, I was in Fort Lee in Virginia, and that's on the Petersburg battlefield. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if you ever, this is kind of a little safety brief for anybody uh, after hearing that. If you ever see ordnance, call somebody who knows what they're doing and don't touch it. 
because there was this dude who would fish out old artillery shells from the uh, siege of Richmond and he would knife out the fuses from the cannonballs back then. But mm -hmm. he didn't realize he found one that was a Navy shell and they always double fuse everything because of weather specifically to avoid this. So they have two fuses that'll detonate the shell. And he didn't realize that he hadn't taken the second shell out and he had oh, put no. it in the the second fuse. Second fuse, he puts it in the back of his pickup truck, walks in, it rolls off his pickup truck, and oh, it no. blew up his whole driveway. <laughs> <laughs> well, could have been worse. Yeah, yeah. But like don't seriously don't touch explosives if you don't have to. Uh the 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 tactics of these guys are actually improving a lot in this chapter too. Uh because they've set up audio listening posts outside Huesca where they're listening for marching and trucks and activity. So they're doing reconnaissance, which is a, a very key part of warfare because you obviously want to know how many guys your enemy has, where they are, and what they're doing. So they're, they're actually keeping track of the fascists' movements via listening to uh, engine noises and marching and all kinds of stuff. So that's a very modern tactic, and it's very interesting that it was applied in a very kind of primitive way at this point. Uh, in warfare. And he does note that, and you've been talking about this the whole time, uh, that the fascists always ring church bells before attacks. So yes. That's another thing that they're always listening for. So, so uh, the poor the poor, uh, the poor, poor fascist conscripts have to go listen to a long Catholic mass in Latin because this is prior to Vatican II <laughs> that they probably don't understand before they have to go and get shot at. So those poor guys. Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. Mass in Latin, and yeah. then announcing your presence. <laughs> yeah, with the church bell. Yeah, that's something that we don't really appreciate now. Because I mean, I grew up Catholic, but uh, the the lat the Latin rite uh, was completely in Latin, and you didn't understand anything of the mass unless you actually understood Spoke Latin. Latin. Yeah. yeah, and that that's and like what is it like? Mel Gibson is one of those like crazy pre Vatican II Catholics that are like, like they want to keep in. I even in one of my scripts actually like um, I wrote uh, called Berserker set in Iceland in the year nine hundred and ninety seven uh, about a real uh, Saxon priest sent to convert the Vikings to to Christianity. Um, and you know, what Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote a poem about this guy's name was Thangbrand. And there's even like a line where he gets mad about someone, uh, slightly mi commonly misquoting scripture and is like, this is why it needs to stay in Latin. <laughs> oh, uh, I've been through like two Latin masses in my life and I'm not going to do a third one. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't recommend it ever. <laughs> so, all right. So, um, we the, the the they're shelling back and forth um there, there's a bunch of propaganda going on um mostly nobody's getting hit a couple of people are getting wounded um and uh let, let's continue on let's keep it moving oh, so there's a no man's land obviously between the two lines and there's a bunch of old kind of mud huts and uh, peasant houses between the two lines and orwell and the other guys are looting those houses uh, while there's lulls at mostly at night and he's, he covers up the windows and he lights a match and he notes that you can find a lot of really cool stuff in people's houses when they're gone, which is kind of funny, but he notes that the uh, fascist water bottles, which I'm going to assume is a canteen are much better than theirs. Uh, the economic destruction uh, he starts to notice uh, of war. Uh, all war is super economically destructive, uh, especially a civil war because you're destroying your own country without the prospect of uh dominating another country the crops are completely unharvested from the previous year and they've started to kind of go to seed a little bit but the troops are actually harvesting the excess food that that's going to waste he notes that they're harvesting a particularly nice little a patch of potatoes that's between the two lines and the fascists actually go out one night and he's like what a jerks they are because they actually go out one night and harvest all the potatoes and orwell has to go find another nice little patch of potatoes to loot <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's a little uh, economy of of uh of war kind of going on here too because he notes that if he got enough potatoes he could go back to the cookhouse and trade the potatoes for a nice pot of coffee <laughs> potatoes for coffee <laughs> well, I, I mean like uh, luxury goods are are super kind of important and we discussed that in previous chapters because you're in really adverse conditions and a nice pot of coffee could really help you out if you're in a dank trench and you have enough food, but you don't have any coffee. You just want something warm, something to keep you awake on a long night watch. 
uh, and so everybody starts just trading potatoes. That that sounds amazing. It uh, it, no, it kind of makes sense. Um, one of my bosses, uh, when I was getting into the uh, professional wilderness guide thing, yeah. he he had spent some time on the AT. He never did the whole thing, but um, he did a long section, and uh, he had started a mini economy with like nutter butter cookies. Yeah. Where it's it got so big that people who didn't like nut or butter cookies carried them to trade them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll remember that if I do the AT. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, the, that culture did not go beyond that group of, of uh, oh, people from the north. All right. So uh, let's keep moving. Yeah. Uh, he, he notes, and we noted this in the last chapter, that it's really odd to him in retrospect that the troops actually really want to get into a fight. Mm -hmm. But they're they're so bored, and I, you can't really blame them because they're just digging trenches and sitting in these trenches all day, and they have these dreams of glorious warfare, and dominating the enemy and kicking them out of uh, kicking the Sp uh, fascists out of Spain. But uh, he notes that they want three things in a, in a positional warfare: battle, more cigarettes, and a week of leave. <laughs> and that, that's true. That's true throughout history. Uh, I mean, before the invention of tobacco, I imagine it would be wine. But <laughs> but. You want to get out of the awful situation you're in. You want something to make it more bearable, hence the cigarettes. And uh, they want the battle to come, if nothing else, just to get it over with. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, you know, a lot of these people are ideological committed partisans. They got there, including, you know, they went there to kill fascists. Yeah. And then they're getting to sit in trenches. But but sitting in those trenches is important, we'll discover in a minute, because mm -hmm. they're getting equipped to actually do an assault. And he notes that he's up to 150 rounds. They're getting steel helmets, which were uh, doesn't sound like much to us, and it isn't because it doesn't really protect that much. But uh, it's kind of cutting edge equipment back then. And uh, they're getting bayonets, which are super important when you have a bolt action rifle, especially yep. in warfare of this kind back then. And grenades, uh, he calls them bombs. Uh, he's not he's not talking about like your old snidely whiplash cannonball thing with a fuse on it. Oh, that's a shame. That would have been great if it was. <laughs> well, I, that's that's how the hand grenade started. Uh, the British grenadiers would actually carry those and the officers would mm -hmm. carry the fuses so nobody lit their stuff too early. Well, as we've seen from your experience with grenades, yeah, it's probably that, pretty good. Probably a pretty good <laughs> idea. But at this point Don't pull the pin. Pull the pin. <laughs> yeah, pull the pin. What? Oh. So you threw the pin and you kept the grenade. What? <laughs> but uh we've discussed this previously. Uh, I'll go over it a little bit. You have different levels of warfare. You have the uh, strategic big picture. You have the operational, I guess, medium picture. And you have the tactical small picture. And what's happening here is that Orwell is part of an operational movement where he's distracting the fascists from a strategic assault on the roads that's going on a little bit up from their position. So we see that operationally he's distracting the fascists from a strategic objective, even if it's a little boring for him. It's actually a very important move. And because the militia guys aren't the best at maneuver and uh, very complicated warfare, this is actually a perfect use for them. So this is actually, it's really boring for Orwell, but it's actually really important for the overall mission that they're trying to achieve, which is to cut Wesco off from the roads and ultimately take the city. And then uh, he notes that they actually got some German stormtroopers. <laughs> so these guys are all probably veterans of World War I. And I remember this. Yeah, the badass yeah. Germans. <laughs> yeah. And, and if you're not familiar with the history uh, of World War I, uh, you should definitely check out the Great War Channel. They did uh, a thing where they went week by week through World War I uh, from 2016 to 2018. Or no, 2014 to 2018, excuse me, for the 100-year anniversary. But Germans basically invented small infantry tactics in World War I. So these guys, if they're veterans of that war, have some of the best training on the planet at this point. And nice. And unfortunately, Orwell is also facing other veterans of that same war who have that same doctrine on the fascist side. Yeah. But, so, uh, these, these guys, not only are they veterans of World War One, but they also are people that like escape Nazi Germany. Yeah. So so they're doubly motivated and doubly pissed, <laughs> so, yeah. which makes them doubly effective. And uh, he notes That's that. I think go back to. No, absolutely. So it's, it's kind of victory or death at that point. He notes that the operation that they were taking part in was to take a hospital, which was a strategic position. And uh, the Germans actually performed their maneuver perfectly. But an army officer who was either a traitor or incompetent gave away the position of the supporting attack, which is supposed to take a hill, <laughs> by throwing a grenade like right when the uh, the assault started. And mm -hmm. he was immediately shot by his men. <laughs> so, like, there's the democratization of military service free right there. Buddy. Um, but the stormtroopers had to move back, and they took a lot of wounded. And it's about a mile to their aid station, 
and they have to carry guys on stretchers. And he's noting a lot of people actually die because they're improperly transported and first aid isn't what it is now. Like we're talking pre-antibiotics, we're talking pre-World War II, after World War One, but we're in a, a country that didn't learn the first aid from World War One. So this is a very not very well developed medical infrastructure, which is going to pop up a little bit in the future chapters. No spoilers for a book that's eighty years old. <laughs> um, uh, and then, then this is the point where Orwell starts talking about how he got lice and everyone got lice. They yeah. uh, they had to burn boots for so for the fires because the boots were so useless that people had to tie ropes around like cloth on their feet to to walk around well and um, you gotta think this is the mountains and there's the, snow yeah. and still the boots are that useless yeah and uh this that comes back to what we discussed in chapter one where logistics is what professionals discuss when we're discussing warfare because you need to get guys beans and bullets and boots <laughs> like these are simple things that you need to get guys it doesn't sound very glamorous but you can't take a city unless you have bullets and you can't you can't march your troops into that city unless they're wearing boots because you're going to lose guys to their feet <laughs> instead of enemy bullets but uh they're they're short of supplies on everything to the point where orwell is getting a lot of his stuff from his wife in uh, Barcelona for through care packages <laughs> and i like she can send him care packages That's i did too cool. And, uh, oh, go ahead. It's, it's real. No, it's just it's funny because I put myself in this position, like because yeah. you know uh, I was asked uh, by some friends uh, to go to fight in Rojava. Oh, and yeah, and they were like, and I, I actually thought about it, but I was like, eh, if I was twenty five and yeah. not married, maybe, but like. And they were like, well, you're not going to go fight in Rojava? What kind of anarchist are you? I'm like, I'm the kind that doesn't want to get shot at. But yeah. like, I think about my wife. My wife would not put up with this at all. And like, if I, she would not be sitting there in Barcelona sending me care packages. She probably would have snuck up to the line, grabbed me by the hair, and dragged me back. <laughs> um, yeah. But it, yeah, but it, it's it's amazing that Orwell's wife is is cool with this, uh, you know, um, yeah. and that she's actually supportive. That's that's actually really. I can't decide if I like that or I'm or I'm wondering what's going on with their relationship. Well, well I, I liked it uh, in that it, it's something that I enjoyed a lot when i was uh, at war where um if you want to actually do this for a u.s soldier there's a thing called soldiers angels mm -hmm. uh, i don't support the war obviously i don't think you do either but i don't want american soldiers to suffer unduly so i send dudes care packages sometimes but uh, if you want to get involved in that you can get involved in soldiers angels and send them um, stuff that they need it's usually soap because as we discussed earlier everybody smells really everybody bad. smells terrible there's but, um if you go to katz's delicatessen in uh the east village oh my um, god i love katz's it's so incredible too much meat on the sandwich it's like no. a between two you're, crackers <laughs> you're, you're wrong there's no such thing as too much <laughs> but yeah they have a they have a uh, a um program for like send a salami to your boy in the army <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's awesome i wish i knew yeah that. it's very 1940s but then again katz's is very it's like 1940s. 1940s uh but yeah uh he gets like cigars and i was actually smoking a cigar as i was reading this chapter so i was like oh hey, or well we're solidarity with you brother <laughs> uh, uh food and all kinds of stuff that he's getting but he notes that a lot of the care packages that are being sent from overseas are seized uh mm -hmm. especially in france which is not particularly predisposed to the left government in uh in spain ah, yes. it's kind of messed up but he, he does say that the uh, army navy stores in britain were one of the only groups that didn't um have their packages seized that were sending stuff over there hmm. and, then, and then he takes a little bit of shot at him for being right wing because he's like i i bet they would have rathered it being sent to the fascists but they did their jobs and actually sent everything <laughs> everything out there well you know who knows with those people i i know um some of the army navy store owners are you know not so reactionary some of yeah. them you know stacked like revolution there, there's there's a great one there's a great army navy store uh in, near mcdougall street in, in new york and that's where i got like my 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 you know star uh zapatistas t-shirt that's where like they, they were selling a lot of like old soviet stuff <laughs> woody allen buys an sks and um i forget what the movie is he buys an sks in that store in, in one of oh. the movies <laughs> yeah i can believe that <laughs> yeah. um uh unfortunately the 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 supply situation is getting really bad and their tobacco is running short, which is really bad when you have a bunch of armed guys who are going through tobacco withdrawal, <laughs> noting that it starts off with a pack a day and then it goes down to eight 
and then five cigarettes a day. And then he notes that there was a 10 day period when nobody had any tobacco. (laughs) (laughs) So you got a bunch of armed dudes going without tobacco. And then unfortunately for Orwell, he gets a poisoned ham, he says, <laughs> and he has to go behind the lines because he's sick. <laughs> sick. <laughs> a poisoned ham. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I actually got sick in Afghanistan. Um, actually, a lot of us did because the, the Coca-Cola Corporation gave us dysentery while I was over there because they, were, they, they, they store huge pallets of water for everybody to drink because it's a hot climate mm-hmm. or, or you just need water to survive both. But uh, we all figured the ones bottled by Coke uh, that had the nicest bottles were the safest. But it turned out they were bottling them in Pakistan, and they all had dysentery in them. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) jeez. So I feel for Orwell, man. (laughs) It's a great weight loss. Coca-Cola, first you send mercenaries to kill union leaders in Nicaragua, and then you give American troops dysentery in (laughs) Afghanistan. (laughs) Yeah, don't don't drink the Kinley water. That's that's what I'm telling everybody. (laughs) I don't think they've stocked it anymore, but if you see it, don't drink it. (laughs) And, And at this point, he notes that uh, he get he got all of his uh, valuables stolen in the hospital, and that the medical people are really bad about stealing everything. He tells a story about an American who's coming over, and his uh, ship gets torpedoed by the Italians, mm-hmm. and he washes up on the beach. And as he's being taken into the stretcher, they take his watch. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It was, is it the beach in in Italy or in Spain? In Spain, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I believe that. I was about to be like, no, dude, I lived in Italy. They, they were still- oh, yeah, they'll steal it all. <laughs> there was, um, yeah, there was somebody who uh, was sending hate mail, like um, Dark Souls 3 hate mail, because it was like a cheater, a guy that was hacking. Yeah. And um, they sent it into like one of the major like channels. And the guy was like, do you know why I cheat? Because he kept messaging after he got caught cheating. And he's like, I cheat because I'm Italian. And like, <laughs> me being born in it, like the streamer didn't understand that. He's like, oh, Okay, and I'm just like, no, no, that tracks. Yeah, <laughs> they, they invented the uh, turning chessboard. So you can... All right, so so let's let's keep it moving. But he does note that everyone steals in the in the army, and mm-hmm. it's funny because we have a phrase now that there's only one thief in the army. Everyone else is just trying to get his stuff back. So, <laughs> that's, that's, nice. so it's still a thing when people are in desperate circumstances, they do desperate things. Mm-hmm. So he gets he gets a little bit of leave in a country village, and we get to see behind the lines again. Uh, the the church and the two landowners' houses in this village are the only two uh, large buildings in the town. And everybody else is kind of materially immiserated. Uh, the flour mill in the town was actually destroyed uh, for firewood for the troops, which is kind of short-sighted, but that's the kind of thing that happens in warfare. Troops troops are fighting. Troops need firewood. We're not using the flour mill. We're going to destroy the flour mill for fire. And they do it in a really inefficient way. He says that they took the floorboards up by tossing a grenade in and <laughs> just blowing up the wood. Just, just, It's just awful when you think about it that you're going to need this flour mill when – the war is over because you're going to need to keep making flour, obviously to make bread and et cetera. But because of the short term needs of war, you're going to have this economic destruction that we're going to destroy the flour mill. And he, he, he feels, and I feel too, uh, kind of intense sympathy for the materially immiserated conditions that these peasants are living. And um, there's uh, messes everywhere, uh, which we've discussed in previous chapters. Uh, mm-hmm. They couldn't, uh, he couldn't find out for sure if the land was collectivized because everything is so disorganized. He assumes it is because it's a POUM area, but he's not entirely sure. And neither are the peasants. <laughs> and they're, they can't go to Oesco, which is the market town, which is super important for an agricultural community that you bring your stuff to the town where the market is to sell it. He, he talks to an old woman where um, she's carrying a lantern. And he's like, where can I get a lantern like that? And she's like, oh, in Oesco. And then they both have a little laugh because they know they're not getting into it. <laughs> I remember this. Um, yeah. Yeah. You can get one in Oesco. Now, yeah. it- I'm mistake by the way because I got a chance to look over this chapter and yeah, remember yeah, a couple of things. Um, have we gotten to the part yet where Orwell punches a rat? This like right after this, where he's he's yeah. sitting in like an awful little like a barn, and th- there's rats just everywhere, and they're used to the humans, so they're not scared of them anymore. <laughs> and he, they wrote a poem about them, didn't they? I think they did. I he didn't print it, uh, but uh, or I'd missed it maybe. Yeah, I think you missed it because it was printed. Hang on, let me find it. Yeah, uh, but, but he, he but he he punches a rat right in the face, and it's like his one moment of solace against the rats. Uh, <laughs> bitch, yeah, uh, he he fe- he also feels a little bit of sympathy for the fascists at this point, who's um, 
property was seized. And that's kind of like a universal thing when you uh, nationalize property that you kind of feel a little bit bad for the guy whose stuff is stolen until yeah. until you realize why his stuff had to be nationalized because these yeah. people are living in these miserable and uh, material conditions because their agriculture is, is super inefficient. It's short of metals to the point where they're using flints to dig uh, seed holes, like flints on a stick. <laughs> he compared it to India, which was not mechanized at this point either. And that they had finally gotten two tractors, which they had seized from capitalists for, oh, for agriculture. Because like, yeah, because at this time people were using like humans lashed to like uh, yolks, like freaking beasts of burden. Yeah. Um, all right. So the poem, and I'm sorry, this wasn't, he didn't write the poem, but it was, yeah. Uh, it gave point to the old army song. There are rats oh yeah yeah yeah. I'm sorry. Rats as big as cats in the quartermaster's store. <laughs> yeah, I did I did read that. I just didn't take a note of it. Yeah, that's there's there's a lot of funny um funny military poems like that get written over the years. Uh, there there's a army marching cadence which I hate marching cadences, but uh, there's a marching cadence where um they it, it goes something like uh, they say that in the army the chow is mighty fine. Uh, chicken jumped off the table and killed a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff like that keeps going. He's also really super thirsty for the local girls, and I wonder if his wife read this chapter. <laughs> let's let's hope she didn't. Uh, but yeah, there is. Um, and and by the way, just so you guys know, the actual writing from Orwell. This is the, the one of the greatest writers of all time yeah. talking about punching a rat. <laughs> yeah, punching a rat right in the face. <laughs> yeah. 50 brutes came swarming out of the ground on every side. If there is one thing I hate more than another, it is rats running over me in the darkness. However, I had the satisfaction of catching one of them with a good punch that sent him flying. <laughs> Beautiful Orwell. <laughs> George Orwell, literary genius, rat puncher. Rat puncher. I'd punch a rat too, man. You gotta Dude, take that. That's what, you know what we need to do? We need to make like a, a freaking George Orwell rat puncher shirt. I could probably get somebody to do like awesome art of Orwell, like uppercutting a rat. <laughs> the poor guy. <laughs> oh man. Uh, something interesting though, here in this town uh, that I, I took a lot of notes of probably at the expense of rat poetry uh, <laughs> is that uh, he notes that the graveyard isn't particularly religious. Uh, in this town and that he, he notes that there's actually bones scattered all over the place, which is super freaky. And I would not be walking in that graveyard. Uh, I'm not superstitious man, but I ain't messing around and finding out, but, <laughs> but uh, there's a couple reasons for this. We discussed already the masses in Latin and the people don't understand it. Orwell notes that the church is essentially a racket in this part of the world, that it's a, a, a kind of an authoritarian, like little um, projection of power into these villages. But also uh, since like the early 1800s, Spain has been kind of in the throes of conflict between uh, liberalism and traditional monarchy. There's a, a period of history called the Carlist Wars, which went from like the 1830s to about the 1870s, on and off, where it was uh, factions that were influenced by Napoleonic uh, French Enlightenment versus factions in the monarchy uh, influenced by like traditional feudalism. And this area around Huesca was actually one of the areas that was a key part of that Carlist War. Mm -hmm. So there's more liberal um, kind of enlightenment in this part of the country than you would actually think there was. And uh, that enlightenment is something that kind of led to the politics that created all these anarchist movements and all these left movements. Uh, yeah, war a lot of sense. Yeah, war doesn't happen in a vacuum. The politics that create war happen over time, uh, usually, and they're continued through violence. And mm -hmm. the, the Carlist Wars are uh, super interesting from like a – if you're looking for like glorious battles and like big Napoleonic set pieces, Carlos Wars aren't that interesting. Politically, they're super, super interesting. Super fascinating. Yeah. So all you nerds out there who like to read nerd books like Bobby, go check out the Carlos Wars. Yeah. Uh, whereas, whereas I will just laugh at me. He punched a rat. <laughs> he, did, he totally punched a rat. I, I, I bet people are punching rats in those wars too. Yeah. Uh, but now, now we're back to the line. So this is, this is actually where it gets super exciting. Um, the, the the attack that they're going to stage is to draw off the fascists. And he writes that he's waiting for like seven hours in the dark. And I was wondering why at first. And then I realized that they've crept really close to the fascist line and dug what he says is about 1,200 meters of trench and built parapets in the middle of the night without being spotted. Just super impressive. That's, uh, that is so cool. <laughs> if, if you've ever tried to move around in the dark um, without being spotted, 
uh, one, uh, good luck escaping the police, but two, <laughs> um, two, uh, it, it's not easy. It's not an easy thing to do. Uh, your voice carries, uh, you're going to step on a branch like in the movies <laughs> and mm-hmm. set off an alarm and building 1200 meters of trench quiet is really, really difficult. And they, gotta, up, it's not just one person doing it too. You got to, you've got to keep yeah. all this. You got to make sure some idiot doesn't throw a grenade. Yeah, so <laughs> and then get shot by his own men. But uh, that they did that was super impressive, and they wind up within about 200 yards of the uh, fascist strong point. And while they're in trenches, they're taking deflate, so they're taking um, direct fire from the front, from above, from a machine gun. So Orwell has to get duck to duck into the trench and take take cover. So he's learned how to duck. Good work, George. You learned to duck. <laughs> and he, he notes that he's he's reading a mystery story while he's being shot at for most of the day. <laughs> and he doesn't remember the plot of it, but he remembers vividly he's sitting there reading it. That, <laughs> Which, that is so badass. Like, <laughs> it's something that I would wind up doing too, because whenever I'd have to duck into a bunker to avoid, um, it was all indirect fire at me, uh, mm-hmm. mortars and artillery and stuff. Um, I usually had a book on me. <laughs> but, uh, I'm just going to sit here and read this book. Yeah, that, that, that's incredible, Bobby. You, yeah, it's going to hit me or it's not going to hit me. After after you get like... But I need to find out what happens to Geralt of Rivia. Yeah, I do. I'm, I was actually reading The Witcher in Afghanistan. This nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, uh, his friend uh, gets shot at and he notes that it almost hit his cash and prizes. Um, which is really funny. It's a very British thing to do as you're being hauled away on a stretcher, noting that it was a little too close for comfort there. <laughs> and it's very British. <laughs> and then it's a mile to the aid station. So the poor guy, uh, uh, and something interesting then, uh, again, not a lot of people kind of appreciate about this kind of warfare is that you're not in the trench until the battle ends necessarily. Cause Orwell goes back and forth between a farmhouse for a kind of relief which is infested with rats again <laughs> and goes back to the trench. And he's really upset about this because he's like, I'm either in the trench getting shot at or I'm in this awful farmhouse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something interesting too, is that they actually have a radio uh, while they're in the, um, they go, they move forward into an irrigation ditch to actually stage an assault and they actually have a radio. He calls it a wireless uh, mm-hmm. Because that was back then, you know, it was a new and interesting technology. And they're like, oh, the wireless, hmm, quite. But uh, the, the, their attack gets called off. But uh, 40 members of the youth league are actually caught out in the open in the grass. And uh, seven are killed by fascist or, or, uh, oh, machine gun fire. Yeah, yeah. Those, were, those were kids. At the, were kids. J, the JCI, the youth league of the Poom. Yeah, the Boy Scouts basically <laughs> getting shredded. Uh, war, is, war is awful, man. And that happens more than people like to admit uh but he he does hear in the distance the main anarchist attack on the road which they're trying to cut off and he describes it really vividly and it's beautiful the way he describes it because uh he can hear the echoes of the gr- the grenades go off and he can hear the artillery and the, the rifle fire just echoing through the mountains and it, it, it's imagery that uh it, it it's terrifying and it's beautiful at the same time and um but at this point he notes that the uh the gunners are getting a lot better on the fascist side. And he speculates probably correctly that they've got German gunners. So now we're moving from guys who are doing guesstimation to, you know, meticulous Germans who are going like, yes, Hans, we have some mass. We will do some mass. We will hit the target. Yeah. And they've been sent there by Hitler directly. Yeah. They're, they're Nazis. Um, yeah. And I think you were talking about, here we go. The line in the daytime, the guns thundered fitfully. Tori Fabian, now our cookhouse, was shelled and partially destroyed. It was curious that when you are watching artillery fire from a safe distance, you always want the gunner to hit the mark, even though the mark contains your dinner and some of your comrades. <laughs> <laughs> Having been shot at by artillery, I don't share that sentiment. Yeah, yeah, that's good. The fascists were shooting well that morning. Perhaps uh, they were German gunners on the job. They bracketed neatly on Tori uh, on Tora Fabian. Uh, one shell beyond it, one shell short of it and then whiz boom burst the rafters leaping upwards and a sheet of ultralight skimming down uh the air like uh, skimming down the air like a nickel play like a nickeled playing card the next shell took off a corner of a building as neatly as a giant might do it with a knife but the cooks produced dinner on time a memorable feat (laughs) <laughs> that is some good writing though i found myself i i it's funny too uh oh a knit like a nicked playing card yeah there we go i was rewriting orwell in my mind i was thinking nickel plated playing card like it's yeah. 
<laughs> but yeah, uh, that bracketing um, in artillery uh, parlance would be uh, they would fire one round to see if they found the range and it went short and then they tried again, they went long and then they found the middle and then <laughs> that's where they started dropping the artillery. So they're, those are, those are skilled gunners at that point. And that's when he starts uh, speculating that they're the, the Nazis. And this is what you had about the anarchists here. Uh, right. And then for many mornings to follow the sounds of the anarchist attacks on the other side of, he of Huesca, always the same sounds. Suddenly at some time in the small hours, the opening crash of several score bombs bursting simultaneously, even from miles away, a diabolical rending crash. And then the unbroken roar of massed rifles and machine guns, a heavy uh, rolling sound, curiously similar to the roll of drums. By degrees, the firing would spread all around the lines that encircled Huesca. And we would stumble out into the trench to lean sleepily against the parapet while a ragged, uh, meaningless fire swept overhead. Holy shit! I have I've got goosebumps. Yeah, it's, you were, yeah. I don't I I don't even remember this line, but you were right. That's incredibly beautiful. It is. It really is. It's it's horrifying and beautiful at the same time, which is kind mm -hmm. of a, kind of a hallmark of warfare. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing that he went through that because like. I, I mean, I knew he was in the Spanish Civil War, but like I didn't know he was in the thick of it until I started actually seriously reading this. And you would no. never guess that from his later life. No, uh, you never would. That that do these kinds of acts is like usually probably created by Hollywood. But you know, a yeah. lot of the time they're just regular people. Yeah, I mean, it, we we focus on the big personalities of the generals, but it's really just ordinary people doing extraordinary things in warfare. Absolutely. Um, so he, let's continue. We'll, we'll finish strong here because I think yeah, we're close to the end of the chapter. We are. He notes that, uh, and this is a real thing too, that the guns have personality based on the velocity and the make of the gun. Like The fascists have a, a 19th century <laughs> cannon in one of the fortresses on one of the hills. And he notes that he can actually see the shell when it comes out of it. And he's pretty convinced that he can actually outrun the shell physically. <laughs> that's going so slow. What, like it's Mario? <laughs> yeah, like it's like a bomb mob coming out. And uh, but, but he contrasts this to some of the modern Russian guns that they have. That uh, they the, he hears the 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 gun go off. He hears the shell flying, and he hears the explosion almost at the same time. So that's a modern like supersonic shell. And then he's got the uh, the mortars with the uh, the awful. Uh, sound. He describes it as a torpedo. But it's not really accurate. Uh, mortar shells. Uh, they did you make a, a whistling sound? I physically actually can't whistle, but if you can imagine me making a whistling sound, uh, that's what it sounds like. I know somebody who can't actually stand those. Uh, you know the little footballs, the novelty ones mm -hmm. that make the whistling sound. I know oh. somebody who ducks every time she hears one of those oh. because she got mortared so much, and they're terrifying. Uh, if you want to hear like a uh, a funnier um, take on the difference between artillery shells. There's a movie called uh, The Lost Battalion. It's, it's pretty. It's a B movie basically, but these two guys from New York actually have a long discourse on how to avoid the different artillery at the beginning. Uh, it's a good movie. Uh, the they, he notes that they have airplanes coming over too, and that they make the worst noise when they drop the uh, the bombs on them. And they're testing dive bombers in this war, both sides but especially the Germans. And the guy who invented the dive bomber for the Germans was a general named Ernst Dudet, who was a um, crazy, crazy dude who invented basically diving at like almost a 90 degree angle and putting a um, air horn on the side of the, the plane so it would make a screaming sound as it was coming in. And that was such a, a, a terrifying tactic for the dudes on the ground. It was also terrifying for the pilots because they couldn't get all the pilots to actually do it. And he couldn't figure out why they wouldn't do it. And somebody was like, we're not all psychopaths like you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not taking this plane into a 90 degree dive. This isn't like this isn't like a flyby wire plane. This is like a 1940s, 1930s plane where you actually physically have to yoke the the stick up. Yeah, so this is this is a scary thing. And the machine guns um, coming off. He says, You're not paying me enough to do this. <laughs> no. he, he also notes that neither side's flak work, and that's a little interesting historical aside. Uh, modern flak uh, anti aircraft shell. Well, now we mostly use like machine guns, but back then. The flak shells, you actually had to guess the altitude of the plane oh, and set geez. the shell before you put it in the gun and fired it. And the British during World War II would actually invent radar um, fuses on the ends of the shells to detect the plane and detonate at the right altitude. Mm -hmm. uh, but they actually didn't want the Germans to know that they had that, so they called it a variable time fuse. 
and they said that their their gunners just had really good eyesight because they ate their carrots. I remember that, and that's why to this day people think eating carrots gives you good eyesight. It's true, yeah. <laughs> so so we're seeing uh, we're seeing when you don't have when you have a guy who has to guess. Oh, that's about eight hundred feet. <laughs> Fire a shell at it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, they, no, our guys are great. They eat carrots. <laughs> yeah. And, totally and then, nothing else. Don't look into that any further. <laughs> oh, yeah. Pip, pip, cheerio. Oh, eat your carrots, wat, wat. My British accent is as offensive as my other accents. And something really heroic happens at the end of this chapter, uh, and it actually plays into some uh, technicalities of warfare, too. Uh, engineers, uh, pioneers, or however you're going to refer to them in your native parlance, are trying to build a parapet and a wall on one side of a bridge to uh, enforce a position. And the fascists are just lobbing mortars at them as they're trying to do it. And they're using concrete and uh, bed posts to use this like rebar. And as they're building, the fascists are firing. At night, they're building it up, and then the fascists are destroying it during the day. Uh, that that excuse me, doing that is a, a heroic feat. Uh, if you're really thinking about it, you're trying to build something as somebody's lobbing explosive mortar shells at you. If you've ever tried to build something in general, it's just not easy. Yeah. But, imagine doing it with like out modern tools and while somebody's firing mortars at you. And this is, uh, this will be the Clausewitz quote for this chapter. Uh, defense is always the strongest form of warfare because the fascists in this case are defending. So they don't have to advance. They can just sit with their mortars zeroed on this position and just keep lobbing them. And they don't have to do anything to stop these guys or they don't have to do anything, but sit there and fire to stop these guys from advancing. But the only possibility of victory in warfare lies in the attack, which is why the anarchists have to cut that road off and take mm -hmm. that city and uh, achieve their objective and move on. So that's something interesting to take away from this chapter, which is really exciting and well-written chapter. Yeah, I know this one. I, this one really got my blood pumping when the yeah. first time I, I read it. And I love just the notion of the, them sneaking a wall and a trench up on the fascists in the middle of the night. Like, cause you know, those guys just like woke up the next day and we're like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, he, he, he says, and I forgot to mention it. He says that uh, two fascist sentries were executed for negligence the next day. <laughs> well, that's a shame, but they were fascists. So we won't. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, <hold> <laughs> I guess they were sleeping so they can sleep forever. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. There's um. so, okay. So what's your takeaway from this chapter overall? Like how, how's your, how are you feeling? Feeling right now how are you feeling about orwell how are you feeling about the war i'm impressed with orwell personally frankly that he was able to um, handle this with such dignity <laughs> uh I, i'm impressed that uh it, it's not every uh well-to-do type person that can actually mm -hmm. get literally in this case get in the trenches and, and put in put in work and orwell does that admirably i'm impressed with the uh, militia guys because they're uh, material situation is improving a little bit. They have ra they have radios now. They're using that. Their their tactics are adapting to the warfare. Uh, despite their lack of training and equipment, they're using tactics that we kind of still use today with the listening posts. Um, mm -hmm. the, the bravery of them to uh, build build like a parapet on a bridge under fire is insane. Uh, the the fact that they realize that they can tie down fascists in the town while they cut off the road is uh, super impressive. And uh, they're overcoming their lack of training, and that's great. The war itself is amping up significantly because we started this book, remember, where he's got like 50 rounds in the rifle and he's holding a mountain pass. But at this point, we're integrating artillery, uh, aircraft, radios, operational maneuver. Uh, the war is going from a workers' uh, revolution to, uh, which is quick, to uh, a long war of attrition. So we're going to see how that works out. And spoiler, it's not that great. Not, not well. But it's impressive but, that they're able to adapt to it that quickly. You know, it's one of the things that I pointed out in in the Darudi script. Yeah. Um, I, I have a scene where Nestor Makhno, a famous uh, Ukrainian anarchist leader uh, who led the Black Army and defeated the uh, like did the final uh, blows against the whites during, and then were you know, uh, betrayed <laughs> and he had to flee to, to Paris, but I actually have him say, um, to Darudi in, in uh, my script, um, that, uh, anarchists, we have strong hearts and very little else. And therefore yeah. we must learn to improvise. And all of one of the things that I find the anarchist tradition and the left libertarian tradition is very, very good at doing. And I saw this at Occupy and we we're seeing this in the book is they're very good at learning on their feet 
and adapting and making things work despite having the deck stacked against him. It's one of the things that I find so incredibly compelling about anarchism and, and about anarchists throughout the ages. Yeah, it really is. Uh, it's especially in this case, it's 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 a world. It's notable from a world historic perspective what they were able to accomplish with so little. Uh, especially when you figure what's going to happen in a few years after this, the the epic. Uh, that is, that World yeah, World War II. Yeah. All right, so that was Chapter 6 of Homage to Catalonia. Uh, Bobby, do you want to plug your pluggables? Yeah, I'm uh, Mustache Mafia on YouTube. I am uh, Mustache Bob 2 on Twitter. I believe you linked me in the description. Mm -hmm. uh, Indeed I did. I'm going to be – I've had a little of a, a drought in content, but I'm going to be putting out some more stuff in the next few weeks. I'm working on um, scripting something about uh, the uh, Frankfurt School conspiracy that the uh, the right wing developed around the same time that we're talking about now. Uh, I'm going to have Brenton on probably this week. We're going to have Boom. A Looking forward to it. <laughs> discussion about uh, pathological politics, which will be super fun. Uh, and I've got a couple other things in the works, so uh, stick with me. And uh, donate uh, Secret Moon Platinum to my George Soros Patreon. <laughs> if you know where it is, uh, you know where to do. <laughs> I could use some Secret Moon Platinum myself. Yeah. Uh, I am Brenton Lengel. Um, Snow White Zombie Apocalypse. Ha, ha, the second issue is shipped. We will be uh, fundraising for the third. And we, we did not win uh, the Ringo Awards that we were nominated for, but we actually lost in great company. We lost to Colleen Duran, uh, who did Snow Glass Apples that directly inspired Snow White Zombie. So that was cool. Um, and we, we lost to Stan Sakai, uh, the Yusagi Yojimbo guy. So I'm okay like losing comp being, I, I love being in like the same uh, company as like freaking comic legends. So, so that was just really a, a, um, uh, a humbling uh you know, just incredible experience. I do, and I blame COVID and Trump for this. I I do uh, have a bit of a of a, st uh, a something sticking in my throat with regard to the Ringo Awards because I found out that normally when the actual Baltimore Comic Con is in person, uh, nominees get treated to surf and turf. Oh God! Uh, yeah, and um, it, it like, and it's like Baltimore surf and turf. So I was really like looking forward to that, but unfortunately, it had to be online this year. Uh, but if you can support the 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 Snow White Zombie comic number three, uh, just keep an eye on Kickstarter and on this page, you, you'll find out when it launches. I, I'm planning to tentatively launch on November 10th, and we've got some amazing people behind the book at this point. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, I'm going to be uh, streaming with Bobby um, uh, for uh, his Mustache Mafia podcast later on this week. We'll settle on a date, and I will also be streaming with uh, Caleb Maupin probably this Sunday, and we're going to finish up the story of uh, the anarchist Che Guevara, my personal, one of my personal heroes, uh, Buenaventura de Rudy in part three. And I'm hoping to do that this Sunday. So keep an eye on the channel. Please like and subscribe and share. Um, I, I really like where this channel is going and the community that we're building here. And, you know, I, I everyone that's been a part of it, thank you. And I hope to have more people be a part of it. All right. Well, from me, Brenton Langell, to all of you, this has been Insurrection with Brenton Langell, Radical Book Club, Homage to Catalonia, Chapter 6, signing out.